Hi everyone, welcome back to CS196. If you attended yesterday's live lecture, thank you so much and thank you all for your great questions during the lecture. It's really great to see everybody interacting with the lecture content. It shows that you guys are understanding what we're going through uh, in the lecture. Unfortunately, we didn't get to cover all the content that I initially planned, so this is a supplement to the live lecture covering the extra commands and a quick recap of what we covered yesterday. So without any further hesitation, let's get right into it. So the first command we covered was ls or list. As you can see, it's pretty phonetic, ls in list. ls will just list all the files in the current directory. And the usage is pretty simple. You just type ls, no arguments, and then you will print all the files in the current directory. So let's clear this out. As you can see, we're in the intro to bash directory right now. And inside the intro to bash directory, we have these three elements. So if I do ls, those are there. But you can also give ls an argument. So if you give ls and then a path, so if I write directory1, for example, it'll list all the files inside directory1. And remember, we covered this. This is a relative path. Uh, what I mean by that is that it's relative to our current position. If I had a slash at the start, I can use an absolute path, like so. And this is not relative to where I am. It's just going from the very start of where the files start from. We also learned about flags, and we learned about the A flag. So A for all, this will list all the files, including hidden files. Hidden files are files that start with a dot and are not visible in the GUI or by just using uh, the ls command. So notice here, we're still in directory one. There's, it looks like there's only three files in here. But if I do ls dash a, we notice there's a lot more in here. So let's go over this. So firstly, we have this dot hidden file.txt. So if I use the cat command, and if you remember it means concatenate, and we open it up, it says, this is a hidden file, spooky. We also have .dsstore. So .dsstore is exclusively Mac uh, file. Essentially, it's, it contains the properties of the folder itself. The singular dot indicates our current directory, and the two dots indicate the upper level directory. What we mean by that is that if we look at the file hierarchy, for example, directory one, its upper level directory is intro to bash. So essentially, it's the folder that encapsulate, encapsulates the current folder that we're in. So for example, we can see the intro to bash in the desktop. So if I do uh, cd dot dot, it'll move us up into the desktop, because the desktop is one level higher. So let's go back into intro to bash and clear that out. Similarly, if I just did cd singular dot, it won't do anything because we'll just remain in the same folder. And if I do like ls dot, for example, it'll list all the files in the current directory because that's what the dot denotes. Also clear, you see me typing that a lot. It's, it doesn't actually clear your screen, it just scrolls down so that you have a new fresh uh, page there to work with. Next, we learn PWD or print working directory. And as the title suggests, this function will print the path to your current directory or the one you're currently working in. And again, use is pretty straightforward. You just type PWD and no arguments and enter and terminal will print the path to the current directory. So PWD, and we see we have the full path to where we are right now. Very useful when you just open up Bash to see where you are, or if you're using relative path, absolute path, sorry, to see how you got to where you are. Okay, and a quick recap of, of the file system we're using. So this is my computer. This red box indicates where we currently are, so our working directory, and these are the files we'll then here. Then we covered CD, or change directory. CD will allow you, as the command says, to change the directory. And its usage is CD, and then you put the path to the new directory you want to go to from your current. And then enter, and you'll change your directory to the new directory. If the directory doesn't exist, then the terminal will print an error message. So if I do cd fake dir or fake directory, it'll let me know that this doesn't exist. But if I do cd directory one, and we can see that we can move from directory one from there, we'll move into directory one. Now when I print the working directory, we're in directory one now. So as we like just demonstrated, if you see the new directory, you'll move into the new directory from the current. So as we just demonstrated, it went from intro to bash to directory one. 
So if you type cd and start the path with a forward slash, you'll use an absolute path. So this means you can go to any directory from your home, not just the current directory. So what we just did was a relative move. We moved relative to intro to bash. So for example, if I type cd directory one now, oop, not cd directory two, sorry, cd directory one now, it'll say there's no such file or directory because from where I am right now in directory one, I'm, I'm here right now, there is no directory one for me to go to. There's nothing relative to that. But if I did the full path, so with the forward slash, users, um, desktop, and then hit enter, it would take me back to where I was because I used a full path. It's absolute, it, doesn't, it isn't relative to anything. So if you type cd dot dot, as we showed previously, you also move up a directory. So if I go to cd directory two and cd dot dot, it'll move me back to where I was initially. So I'm in directory one right now, cd directory two, or oh, let's clear first. I'm now in directory two. If I do cd dot dot and then put the working directory, I'm in directory one again. And we can move up to intro to bash and even up to users using the absolute path. We covered cat. Cat is short for concatenate. And you display the contents of a file. So the usage is you type cat followed by the file you want to read or the path to the file you want to read. And the terminal will print the contents of the file. So if I go back to um, intro to bash. We can see in intro to bash, we have these two files in here. So if I cat the files, I can see their contents. And just to be doubly sure this is actually what's in here, I can open this up and we see that's actually what's in the file. So this is useful when you wanna quickly read a short file or quickly see what's in the file without actually having to open up your ID or something. Helps you save time. But we don't just have to read files in the current directory. I can also read files that are in directory one, for example. So if I do cat and I put the full path, directory one, and then fileender.txt and hit enter, this is a text file inside another directory. So I didn't have to be in directory one for me to see, to read the file inside directory one over here. Touch, touch will create a file in the current directory or you can give a path to create it in another directory. And the type of file depends on the extension. So you do touch, file name, and then dot the file extension. And you'll create a file in the current directory with that name and extension. So as examples show, you can make different kinds of files like this. So from here, I can do touch um, sumtext.txt. And then watch over here. We created this file. But similarly with uh, the cat, I can do touch and give the path to the file, directory one, new file in dir and hit enter. And now look, a file was created inside directory one, even though I am currently in here. Pretty cool, right? And notice how this file has no extension. You can make files with no extension. You can make files with fake extensions. You can make doc files, Python files, whatever you want using the touch command. So we can create a new file like this, new file.txt in directory one. So let's just do that for, I'll just rename this. Don't worry, you learn how to rename files for terminals soon too. All right, now RM. Like we covered, RM is very, very dangerous because it doesn't move things to trash. It permanently deletes it, permanently deletes it. RM is short for remove. And your usage, you type rm and the file you want to delete or the path for the file you want to delete and the file will be deleted permanently. So, come back to that. Let's delete this file that we just made. We can do rm new file.txt and that file is now gone. Won't be in the trash, fully destroyed. We also destroy pad, uh, we also delete, sorry, files that are in other directories. So if I give the path to this new file that we made, or sorry, new file under, that's one we want to delete, and hit enter. That file is also gone. 
and note again permanently deletes it. So what you can also do is rmrf. So firstly, let me demonstrate what happens when I try to delete a directory. So if I try to delete directory, let me know. Nope, you can't delete it. It's a directory. And this is a safety precaution because directories, even if they're empty, they could potentially have files within them. So what rmrf does is it's a recursive command. It will delete the file and directory and all its underlying components. So if I deleted my desktop, for example, it would delete all the files here and here and here and here. It would just go all the way through recursively and delete everything. So RMRF is very, very dangerous, very powerful, but it can also save you a lot of time if you're trying to delete like a huge folder with a bunch of garbage. So be very, very careful if you're using RMRF. Okay, make mkdir or make directory. Uh, we'll make an empty directory. So pretty basic, you just write mkdir in the directory name or the path, and you'll create a new directory. So let's go into directory two here and make a new directory, like so. So let's just follow that same thing here on this side. Oh, we still have that from yesterday, so let's just um, remove that. So let's make the directory and call it new directory. And notice that folder is there now. Again, we can give it a path to make it somewhere else. So at this point, we ask you if you have any questions. So we have our Kahoot here. And now, continuing on with the new commands that we didn't get a chance to cover in the lecture. So first one is rmdir, or remove directory. So remove directory will delete a directory. But note, it will only delete an empty directory. Again, this is a safety precaution because you don't want to delete a directory that might have several files and other directories within it. So rmdir will only delete an empty directory. And similarly to make directory, the usage is pretty basic. You just write rmdir, the directory to delete, to permanently delete the directory. If the directory does not exist or is not empty, then the terminal will print an error message. So let's delete this empty directory first. So rmdir new directory, and we'll have no issues there, no uh, complaints. But if I move up one, so now we're in this directory here, so we're in directory one. If I try an rmdir directory two, it's going to throw me an error there. It'll say directory is not empty. If I really want to delete it, I could use rmrf directory two to delete everything here. But I don't want to do that at the moment. So as we just showed, we are able to delete that directory. All right, now we have a new command, mv, or move. And move has two main purposes, to rename a file or to move a file to a new location. So to rename a file, so the file you want to rename to, so a few notes about this. If you're trying to rename the file to a file that already exists, that original file will get overwritten. So what I mean by that is, let's say I make, I have this file here, right? If I make a new file, random.txt, and I try to rename random to file in dir, all these contents get overwritten and it'll be, and whatever is inside random.txt will replace this and this will get deleted. So if the file name is not in use, then you will simply just rename your file and the usage is mv, original name, and the new file name, or the path to where you want to have the new file be. And the contents of the original file will be moved to a new file, and the original will be deleted. So if I were just to, um, let's do mv renamed.txt, oops, sorry, mv, and then first leave the original file name, so random.txt, and then renamed.txt, It'll, just, it'll rename the file. Easy peasy. But let's say I now rename it to this file here. So notice how this has nothing in it and this has the text there. If I do mv rename.txt and try to rename it to file in dir, now file in dir has the contents of rename.txt, which was nothing. 
So we overwrote that file. So be careful when you're using MV because you don't want to overwrite files that you might need. I know I'm saying be careful a lot. That's because Bash is a very powerful tool and you should be careful you know, with great responsibility. Great power comes great responsibility. Oh, so now let's try to do this. So what, uh, the other thing we can do is go from a directory here and move a file here. So let's go into intro to bash and let's try and move file one into directory two, was it? Yeah, directory two. So if I list the files here, file one is here. So if I do nv file1.txt and now I'm gonna give it the path to where I wanna put the file. So we go from intro to bash, directory one to directory two. So the path is gonna be directory one directory two. Now watch this. When I hit enter, that file disappears and now appears in directory two. All right. So we were able to move the file. You also move the file to a new location by using multiple files. So if I did MV and then use multiple files, and then finally the directory to move the files to, then all the specified files will be moved to the new specified directory. So for example, file one and file two are now here, just hanging out. Let's move all of these to intro to bash. So, nv file1.txt, file1.txt. Oh, I'm in intro to bash right now, that's why I couldn't move them. cd directory one, directory two. So now I'm in directory two over here. If I do mv file1.txt, file2.txt, and then I want to go up, so let's go up one, two, so that'll be dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, because we're going up from here to here, and then here to here, which is what enter to bash is. When I hit enter, oh, sorry, enter over here, those files are moved here now, and if I go to directory two, the files are no longer here. All right. So let's just move this file back into directory two for our purposes of the demo. Okay. So we're able to move those up one, or I guess we moved it up two actually. Okay, now we have a new command CP or copy. Uh, copy will copy a file into a new location. So it's very, very similar to move, except you will now have two versions of the file. In move, you only have one version at any given time. With CP, you'll have a new version, like control C, control V. So keep keeps the original file, whereas MV moves or renames. So let's try to take file.txt and make a copy in this directory. So first things first, let's move file1.txt into directory one. So now we're in this state. So from here, we want to copy file1.txt so that this is, look at the content here, let's cat file one actually. Oops, sorry about that, cat file one. So this is the content inside file one. Now let's copy this. So we're going to take copy file1.txt into directory two, and we're going to give it a name, file1.copy.txt. Now it might not look like anything happened, but if I open directory two, there's a new file here. And if I go into directory two, and I cat this file, file one copy. The content is exactly the same as you can see here. So copy, copies a file. Most of these commands, uh, you can guess what they do just by their name. Okay, so man. Man is short for manual. And this is a super powerful command because it brings up a manual for each command within your terminal. So you can just type man, some command, and hit enter, and the manual will open up. 
and note. So we've talked about this briefly, but it opens it up in Vim. Vim is a bash text editor. So from the difference between Vim and most text editors is that you can't click and point on things. You have to use your keyboard for everything. So let's first demo this with man CD. So man CD pulls up the manual for the CD command. So now you're in Vim. So in Vim, there's a couple of ways to move around. You can use J to scroll down, K to scroll up. The most important thing you want to know with Vim is how to get out of it because people get stuck in here and it's like an online sales joke actually where people don't know how to get out of Vim. You're stuck in here, you don't know what to do. The way you get out of Vim, listen very carefully, you press escape, colon, WQ. Or, if you CD again, WQ will save it and close. It won't actually edit the file, but the best way is escape, colon, Q, exclamation mark. Or just Q works fine, I guess for man. So the benefits of man is, even though I'm telling you how to use these commands, a lot of these commands have extra flags and a few specific, like, things about them that I haven't covered because you probably won't use it in most of your day to day or maybe ever. But for example, if I did man ls and I went through, I can see there's a bunch of flags here that we didn't cover and you might never use, but it's useful to know just in case you might want this extra functionality. So man is a very useful command, uh, short for manual, will help you learn about commands and if you ever Want to learn more about a command you can do directly from bash you don't even need access to wi-fi hey guys sorry about the awkward cut i wanted to go over one more bit of bash functionality that i think is very useful uh, in helping you debug or just in general working with bash so let me hide my face for a second so basic piping to files so piping allows you to redirect output from the command line so what we can do is take whatever we expect to come out of the command line and put it into a file instead so what we use is this uh, greater than symbol. Greater than? The pointing arrow. It just redirects the output. So what this does is you type some command, the arrow, and then a file name. And nothing will be printed in the terminal, but that output will be put into some file.txt. What's important about the single caret is that it does not append, but will create a new file. So let's overwrite the file each time. So for example, if I do ls files.txt, I will list the files, but pipe the output into files.txt. So what this looks like, or the end result, will be that nothing is printed in the command line, but files.txt will have the expected output instead. We basically just move where the info is going to be printed to. It won't be printed in the command line, but printed into files.txt. But if I kept doing this command again, ls arrow files.txt repeatedly, it'll look like nothing happened because file.txt will keep getting overwritten. So although it is doing the list and piping each time, it won't look like anything's happening because the file is getting overwritten continuously. So now we have the arrow arrow, or caret caret. So what this does, it lets you append output to the file. So the usage is you type some command, arrow arrow, some file.txt, and nothing will be printed in the terminal, but it'll be appended into some file.txt. And this either creates a new file or appends to an existing file. So for example, the usage is ls arrow arrow files.txt and it'll list the files but output into files.txt. So again, very similar to the single arrow, it looks like nothing is printed, but there will be a new file with the info that should have been printed out. The difference is if I keep doing this command over and over again, the content of file.txt will be appended to. So we'll just keep adding that information to the end of the file. So we'll keep like adding that same number of lines to the file repeatedly. So this makes more sense if we actually demo it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to first print our working directory. So we are in intro to bash right now. So if I go to intro to bash, we see we have these three files. If I do a regular ls, this is what we expect to see. But let's try piping this output into file.txt. Hit enter. Now there's a new file here, if you just saw that. So I ls now, there's an extra file in there. If I do cat file1.txt, it has all the output. Pretty cool, right? But now let's repeat this again, and again, and again. 
if I do cat file1.txt, nothing changes because it's overriding itself each time. So let's clear this out and remove, or we'll keep, we'll keep it there for now. Let's ls and do arrow arrow file.txt. Now when I cat the file, notice it's appended to it. So if I were to do this repeatedly, it'll keep appending the list output into file.txt. So again, what piping does is it redirects the output. Instead of printing it into standard out or into the terminal, it'll pipe that into a text file instead. And this is really useful for when you want to have like a Python command to run important information into a file so you can save it. And for other general purposes, I'm sure you'll find something useful that you can do with piping. So I hope that was helpful. Okay, now a couple of useful tips. So you might have seen me be able to type very, very quickly or like write the first two letters and suddenly fill up uh, the whole path. I'm not actually typing, I'm using tab autocomplete. So when typing in terminal, you can press the tab key to autocomplete. So notice I am in directory two right now, right? So instead of typing uh, cat file one underscore copy, I can just do file one tab and hit enter and it'll automatically autocomplete. You have to write enough so that you have like a clear definition. So if I go cat F and hit tab, it doesn't know which file I'm referencing here. The benefit of ZSH actually is that if you keep pressing tab, eventually it'll let you just choose between the two. Bash won't let you do that, but ZSH will. Um, so I can just do that, hit enter. Very, very useful. It's also very useful when I want to CD to different pads. So let's say I'm trying to, I'm trying to use the full absolute path. If I do cd slash users, you know, type everything, that takes a very long time. If I can type slash u, and it'll autocomplete users, it'll autocomplete my name, desktop, intro to bash. It's a very, very quick way of typing, of sorry, not typing, of uh, putting things into the terminal, like so. This is very useful, definitely use tab autocomplete. It's not worth typing nonstop. If you're in terminal, you can use the up and down arrow keys. So second point is just up and arrow keys to scroll through your previous commands. So another thing to note is you type the start of the command and then scroll, you'll see the history of commands you enter that starts with what you typed. So that might not make a lot of sense, but let me show you. If I'm, so right now I'm pressing the up arrow key, it'll give me all the commands that I typed previously, like history. So if I wrote a super long command, like, you know, like this is kind of tedious to type, I can just scroll up and find it. But let's say I only want to see all the times that I CD'd. If I type CD space and then press the up, it'll only show me all the CD commands that I previously, previously did. And this is really useful for when you're looking for a very, very specific command that you wrote previously, but you don't want to type the whole thing out. Uh, next, okay, this one is super, super important. Control C will end the current program. So if you're ever stuck in a loop in Bash or something is taking too long to download and you're concerned and you just want to stop it right there, Control C will end the current program. So for example, there's a command in Bash called yes. If you do yes and put a message in like, what does this do? It's gonna keep printing that message over and over again and you can't do anything. You can't hit clear, you can't hit escape because it's printing so quickly. The only way you can stop this is by pressing Control C and that'll stop the command. So control C is super useful. You should use that to end programs because uh, you can continue where you were working from without having to close and restart your terminal. Remember that, very, very important. And finally, the command exclamation mark, exclamation mark will bring up the previous command entered up. So if I did exclamation mark, exclamation mark, and enter, it'll just pull up in the terminal. It won't actually start the command. It'll just bring it up for you like that. Again, useful depending on the situation. All right. And just for fun, uh, if you stuck around at the end of the lecture, you probably already saw me do this, but I did say at sort of yesterday's lecture, I would take you from plus help in bash to being a big matrix hacker guy. So C matrix is just a fun command, uh, type it into bash and it gets you like a matrix theme in here. The way you get it is by downloading homebrew so Homebrew isn't just for fun games and stuff like this. Homebrew is really useful to get powerful packages 
into Bash. Uh, so I'll just read this Wikipedia definition out. Homebrew is a free and open source software package management system that simplifies the installation of software in Apple's macOS operating system and Linux. So what that means is it let, you can just do brew install some package and it will automatically get downloaded and installed into your Bash, uh, Bash terminal. It's very, very convenient and it's a very easy way to get very, very powerful tools downloaded directly, downloaded and installed directly into Bash. What we're going to use it for is to get this. You just write brew install cmatrix, and you can just type cmatrix, and you have this fun uh, aquarium, not aquarium, um, fun matrix theme animation going on. Great if you're in the library and you just want to look like you're really, really smart. Another cool one is ASCII Aquarium. You just download homebrew again, run brew install ASCII Aquarium, run it, and you get a cool animated aquarium within your terminal. Another fun one, not very useful, but not everything has to be super useful. Some things are just fun. So I hope everything we covered makes sense. If you have any questions, please drop it in our Piazza or Discord or comment on the video and I will answer them. Uh, starting next lecture, we're going to cover even more commands. So these are the very, very basic commands that you need to get started with Bash. Starting next uh, lecture, we'll cover more commands that are very useful and being very productive and doing things that you can't do without the bash terminal. So thank you guys for all tuning in. I hope uh, you learned something from this.